Welcome. Tonight, tonight is the second event in the Architecture Department Symposium, The Eclipse of Beauty, co-convened by Antoine Picon. And tonight, our topic is taste. Kant isolated two necessary conditions for a judgment to be a judgment of taste, subjectivity and universality. That is, a judgment of taste is based on a subjective feeling of pleasure or displeasure, and these same feelings occur in everyone who encounters the same aesthetic experience. This is what Kant called the universal subjective, and roughly speaking, this is what Deleuze called affect. Today, both of these aspects of judgments of taste, subjectivity and universality, tend to create unease and embarrassment. We have long been in a, in a retreat from universality and long ago fell into the tendency to treat everything subjective as a private affair. Judgments of taste demand the agreement of others, and this has come to be seen as a symptom of elitism, if not authoritarianism. Taste has a connotation of the canonical that even beauty cannot muster. Pierre Bourdieu convincingly painted a picture of the on-the-ground reality of taste as an exclusionary device wielded by the upper class. Embarrassment about taste has tended to leave architects mute, and explicit criteria of judgment have been publicly abandoned in favor of the mystique recently, most recently, of performativity. Judgments of taste have been left to critics who then seem to be increasingly living in their own idiosyncratic worlds in which no one else cares very much to participate, but which architects love and can't live without. The implicit relativism that accompanies the waning of a discourse on taste in fact creates a situation in which all judgments are supposed to be equally valid and therefore beyond dispute. Someone who claims to distinguish between the beautiful and the ugly must admit to be the possibility of being wrong. Without taste, this doubt and humility need not exist. So there is, I think, a necessary correlation between the absence of judgments of taste and a smoothly functioning market. Relativism allows spectacle, kitsch, and purely functional amenities to coexist side by side as long as they're functional or performative without a hint of conflict. Paradoxically, though, it has been the popularization and the commodification of the star architects, people like Gary, Kulhas, Saha Hadid, and the ecological movement that has helped disseminate the difficult matter of taste coming out of the academy to a general audience. Perhaps newness has even become a universally pleasurable attribute, replacing harmonic proportions once and for all. It's hard to call the painfully outdated tasteful. People like Jeff Kipnis, Sylvia Lavin, and many others have sought to align the changing whims of architectural fashion with the very essence of architectural expertise. To be judged timely, relevant, and in good taste in, in avant-garde circles now is to know the trajectory of the discipline and to be working only on the newest problems. The pure relativism that we are in now has abolished the solid grounds against which to mount a critique. And so we have a situation in which what has been erased is what Kant would have called something like common sense. The sense, in this case, of taste that we all could hold in common. Everything is disparate, and in this unmitigated relativism, discourse tends to be flattened. And this brings us to tonight, because on this occasion, without a doubt, the discourse will be anything but flat. We have here two very wonderful people who I believe will make it quite interesting <laughs> to talk about this matter, George Tesseau and Evan Douglas. And let me begin by introducing George Tesseau. Um, truly for me, and I have known the work for all of the time since I was a student, one of the most original historians and theorists who has dealt with the city, landscape, architecture, architecture, all in the modern period very grandly conceived, if we were to talk about it as modern. And he has, as everyone knows, parsed Foucault as easily as he has the concept of things like the domicile 
is as able to reflect on the new digital media as he is on the environments they yield. Representation, artificiality, hybridity, the machine, architecture as a prosthetic apparatus, there are so many topics and ideas coming from his work that have changed the discourse in the schools for the many years that, well, that I've been in the schools. And um, of course, this is extended to many of his writings that you will know. Uh, among those, the architecture of Western gardens, interior landscape, the surface of everyday life, the American lawn, and a recent article, which particularly interests me lately, Windows and Screens, a topology of the of intimacy and extimacy, I believe a term coming from psychoanalysis, which deals with the problematization of the relationship between the inside and the outside, the way we think about the threshold, which of course is an obsession personally of mine actually, but only in design. <laughs> and uh, well, George, you may know, he is, has taught history and theory at the UIL in Venice, at the ETH in Zurich, is and at Princeton, and is presently at Laval University's uh, School of Architecture, where he's a professor in Quebec. Um, with no further ado, let me introduce and welcome George Tesso. Well, this was uh, just as an, an excuse for the for the uh, the kind of disorder I will present. This is it was in, 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 imposed on me two months ago, and this is not a ready-made lecture. I, I just invented it recently, so uh, pl please bear uh, with the lecture and with my excuses, <laughs> both of them. Um, but. Um, I must say, uh, I'm, I'm glad satisfied uh, with the fact that I had to work very, very hard for, for this evening because it, it, it has forced me to come back to some reading that I hadn't done uh, since a very, very long time. Um, and, and maybe uh, through uh, the, the person who invited me did remember that at, at what, in a previous life and at, at one time I, I was a, a, a scholar of 18th century, but they, it, it sounds so, so long and, and so, such a different world and life that I can't even imagine that somebody can remember that period. It, it brings you back to the 70s, just to say, <laughs> like on, on Letterman, there was a young actress who said, <laughs> Yeah, you were living in the 70s. <laughs> so I feel like Lederman. <laughs> I did live through the 70s. And by the way, there was nothing funny about the 70s <laughs> compared to the 60s. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm obliged to, to come back to the line of, of beauty of, of Hogarth. One has to, to start from... from uh, somewhere, um, and in the uh, in the cover of his book, he uh, does introduces um, the um, uh, the uh, idea of uh, the uh, serpent serpentine uh, line. Um, and uh, you can do the. from Hogarth. I'm sorry I have to move that because I was planning to have uh, two screens. But since we have only one, we'll share the same one. <laughs> and then I read the, the quote, the serpentine line, by its waving and winding, at the same time, different ways, lead the eye in a pleasing manner along the continuity of its variety. You will see how gradually the changes in its uh, shape are produced. How imperceptibly, in, imperceptibly, or I can't pronounce that, the different uh, curvatures 
run into each other and how easily the eye glides along the wavings uh, of the sleep, the sweep. Uh, and of course, this could be, a, immediately can think that this could be applied to the architecture of today. And I totally, totally agree. I will, I will try in a way to, to show that this is a line, that, that there is a line in, in, in my resume, in my uh, a presentation that we lead from that quote to some curved form uh, uh, of today. But, but the, it is a complicated story. And uh, <clears throat> as it was shown before, uh, it is a story about variety, curved, uh, rounded forms, uh, or here uh, we have the um, winding or serpentine, serpentine line which is uh, quoted again by, by Hoggers. And Hoggers give uh, two funny examples. Those lines here, which are, this is a detail from here, and the corset uh, of a woman uh, in, uh, appears somewhere there, uh, number four. The, Somebody who really liked reading Hogas was Edmund Burke, the, the uh, inventor of the uh, book on the beautiful and the sublime, on the sublime and the beautiful. The idea of variation has led Mr. Hogarth, whose idea of the line of beauty uh, I take extremely just, to consider angular figures as beautiful. Few angular objects are entirely angular, but I think those which approach the most nearly to it are the ugliest. So here we have a, a new concept uh, which is introduced, which is the ugly. Before we had the beauty, and now we, we have the ugly. Beauty and ugly. And then uh, in another part of the book, he, he writes, nor it is only in the, in the touch that spurs bodies cause positive pleasure by relaxation. Let us consider the taste. And he, for as fluidity, as fluidity depends on the roundness, smoothness, and weak cohesion of the component part of any body, it follows that the cause of its fluidity is likewise the cause of its uh, relaxing quality. If you have uh, tried um, how smooth globular bodies as marbles have affected the touch when they are rolled backwards and forwards, you will easily conceive how sweetness affects taste. Um, so we have an entirely new kind of uh, aesthetics. We are definitely out of the, the Renaissance system of proportion, and we are on a very, uh, I would say, percep perceptive system, or a system based on, based on, on, on perception. But then comes dear old Kant. Oh my god. I haven't read Kant in 20 years, and how hard it is, you can't imagine. Don't even try. <laughs> because the, the amount of, pleasure, of pain <laughs> and the proportion of pleasure is, is not a good one. <laughs> and I, I shouldn't even touch uh, uh, Kant. Uh, there is no time to, to, to think about it. Uh, and to really uh, explain it. I mean, just try to read that, uh, the first sentence. The beautiful is that which, apart from a concept, pleases universally. Wow. And beauty is a form of finality in an object so far as perceiving it apart from the representation of an end. What does that mean? And, and the great difficulty with Kant is that he doesn't agree in, he, with himself because he has a system and then he changes the system when you go through the book, when you go through the critique of, of judgment. No, no wonder why the Romantics hated uh, uh, Kant. No wonder why Nietzsche uh, called him, called him uh, uh, some kind of obscure philosopher from Konigsberg that nobody should read. <clears throat> Oh, 
On one side, pure aesthetics. On the other side, mechanical art. In the middle, the fine arts. That is the first part of the system of Kant. But then he changes everything. He will introduce the concept of genius. And, and genius is a productive factor, is what helps the work of art to, uh, to, to be created, to, to be produced, to be done. So genius is associated and combined to the fine arts and uh, should create uh, pure aesthetics. But then he introduced a new distinction between taste and genius, which is a very tra traditional one, uh, by the way, which existed since uh, the Renaissance. Taste is, um, is receptive of the uh, aspect of, of pure uh, aesthetics. It's, it's the, uh, on, on the reception side. It's about the public, what people feel, look at when, when they see a work of an art. It's about, all about critique, critiquing a work of art. And genius is all about production. And, and then there is a, a shift and the system will, will, will shift again and cha slightly change again. And then genius is uh, opposed to taste. Genius as a productive matter as opposed to taste as a receptive. And art will be the combination, in a way, of, of both. Genius, at the end of the book, becomes equivalent to the content and is created. This content is given by imagination. On the other side, taste is a producer of form and starts to uh, and, and, and belongs to the system of understanding. A very difficult system, which explains why uh, a lot of uh, people start to, to resist against um, these people, and, and, and especially in, in Germany. I'm alluding to the Romantics, to, Sch to Schiller, Schlegel, and, and, and so on. There is an in interesting matter that Kant himself introduced, uh, which is the ugly. He says, of course, a painting can represent something ugly. So a, pain, a beautiful painting can represent something ugly, like a massacre. You can make a, it's a, a paradox, but you can make a beautiful representation of something absolutely awful. Um, there is one, one thing that one cannot accept, which is, and you have it here in the middle of, of, of the quote, which is disgust. Disgust is the limit given by Kant himself. Um, so let's say that ugly is becoming more and more interesting. And in fact, ugly is much more fun. The ugly appears already in the treatise of uh, Jean Claudius Loudon, who, who was a gardener in England during the 19th century. Um, Deformations start to appear here also. So the beautiful, the picturesque, the ugly, and the deformed. And ugliness becomes the cool thing. In 1853, Karl Rosenkranz writes an aesthetic, uh, an aesthetic of ugliness, uh, which hasn't been translated uh, in, uh, in English yet but is translated in French. It's a very interesting book. This is the cover of the, uh, the, the current edition uh, in German. And the graphics, the, the graphic people who made the cover are, are putting a kind of kitschy uh, uh, representation. So they in instinctively associate kitsch with uh, the ugly, which is a very contemporary reading and a possible one but probably not what Rosencrantz uh, wanted to say. The strange thing is that Rosencrantz was uh, the editor of the works of Kant in Germany. He was a pupil of Hegel. So his Aesthetic of Ugliness is a book um, written in 1853. It is among the earliest writing on the f 
on the philosophy of ugliness and draws an analogy between ugliness and moral evil. It argues that the, a metaphysics of beauty should not be dissociated from an aesthetic of ugliness. The concept of the ugliness, which is defined as a negative beauty, is part uh, of the aesthetics. A pupil and biographer of Hegel, Rosenkampf will become, in 1853, professor at the University of Königsberg, occupying the position held by Kant himself. And he offers a classification of, of ugliness. And I quote, it is the whole universe of the ugly that I deploy from its first chaotic nebulous manifestations, listing all there is from the amorphous to the dissymmetrical, up to the more dense examples of the disorganized beauty represented by caricature. The absence of form, the lack of correction, the deformity, deformitet der Verbildung, the deformity constitutes the various uh, degrees in such a coherent series of metamorphoses. So here we have a very serious theory of ugliness. Uh, and a pupil of Hegel, he was from the left. He was involved in the uh, revolution of 1848 in German. Let's say he's a nice guy. He's a very interesting person. And ugliness now is, back, is the fun thing which is exactly what Baudelaire was saying in Paris. Beauty is always bizarre, and this will give um, rise to the flowers of Evils, of course, his poetry, and, and, uh, and, and whole aesthetics, uh, a modern um, aesthetics uh, based on evil, uh, I mean evil, sorry for the pronunciation, and so on. And, and so forth. Sorry. My fourth point, and, and this is not a, uh, what is the name of Darth Vader? This is not a quote of, from Darth Vader. <laughs> the line is a force. <laughs> It could. It is a, it is a quote from uh, Henry van der Velt. How to represent certain energies as they appeared at the end of 19th century. In his essay on the line, Die Linea, of 1902, van der Velt claims that the line is a force and that lines are able to translate latent forces which wait impatiently before transforming themselves into action. So uh, he's referring uh, to, kind of, to a kind of vital source uh, of the force that, that finds its concrete uh, application and, and form in the line. So we, we, I, I, if we were during the, the whole history of uh, the line, which is possible and interesting, this would be, a, this would be a, an important chapter. Our friend Siegfried, who uh, taught in, in Harvard for many years, was brought by uh, Walter Gropius, uh, wrote many books, uh, not in those worlds, I suppose, but uh, at least on, on this campus. Of course, Siegfried Giegen is, is against beauty because he's against the classical beauty. He's an interesting guy because at least he's interested in surrealism, as this montage shows. This clip and all this writing is, is done by, by himself and, and come from his archive. Uh, of course, he he's, has all the obsession of modernity, Licht, Luft und Hoffnung, uh, light, air, and, and opening. He's against beauty as traditional beauty, platonic, Thomistic uh, beauty. Beauty means a house that fits our way of life. It's a kind of... You know, the, the new paradigm of modernity, of comfort, uh, transparency, um, etc. And, and the line appears also in Gideon. Since uh, when he arrives in America, he discovered the, the American highways, the, the work of Robert Moses in New York, and, uh, and becomes totally, 
totally enthused by, by the, this new kind of uh, uh, landscape. And then also, uh, in the book, he, he actually uh, wrote uh, during the war, uh, sorry, uh, in America, the mechanization text command. Um, he um, was one of the first uh, critics to discover the work of uh, Marais, of Eti the scientist Etienne Marais, uh, and the, uh, the chronophotography of Marais which introduced uh, in, in an interesting way the, um, this issue of, of the line and, and the fourth line. The next step could, could be, uh, be uh, Banham's topology. Banham was actually obsessed by topology, so was people of his, uh, many uh, people of his period, in the post-war period, just a quote, as a discipline of architecture, topology has always been present in a subordinate way. But here in this project of Smithson um, for Sheffield, the Sheffield University, the roles are reversed. Topology becomes a dominant and geometry becomes a, a, subordinate, a subordinate discipline. Um, this is how the line becomes. The line be becomes a, a, a figure of topology and su such a, d a dominance, it is quite hard to understand how it works with Banham himself, uh, because he is interested. It, it, it was very f fashionable at that time. Here is an issue of Scientific American of 1950, which uh, Banham uh, quotes and, and knew uh, very well. Come on, baby. a heavy one. Huh? Could you could you change the slide please? It's a heavy one. Thanks. And uh, this for Banan by the way is what he meant by topology. Uh, and precisely, for instance, the, the Virandal uh, beam system allowing uh, free space for pipes, ducts, etc. It, it, from seen from today, it is not something very exciting. Or the Marco Zanuso's uh, Olivetti factory uh, in Argentina, uh, which uh, cre creates a kind of hybrid building, mixing uh, air conditioning uh, and structure. This, this will lead to, to some uh, hypothesis. Uh, uh, I do, uh, so this becomes uh, something that happens today. It's, it's kind of a conclusion of my presentation. Um, I call it a topology of, of the living. Um, Deleuze was inspired by Gilbert Simondon's, the great uh, French uh, uh, philosopher, um, Gilbert Simondon's theory of the membrane, while attempted to construe his assumptions about pre-individual singularities. Deleuze noted that membranes are no less important for they carry uh, potentials and regenerate polarities. They place internal and external spaces into contact without regard to distance. The internal and the external depth and height have a biological value only through this topological surface of contact. Well, here, uh, within the biology of this period, the, the concept of uh, topology comes back and is quoted by Deleuze. This will lead to a consideration about the folded surface of the cell then Deleuze insert a quotation extracted from Simondon, uh, uh, Simondon's thesis. The characteristic, the ca characteristic polarity of life is at the level of the membrane. Now, is at the level of the membrane. It is here that life exists in an, in an essential manner as an aspect of a dynamic topology. 
the entire contact of this internal space is topologically con in contact with the contact of the external space at the limits of the living. There is, in fact, no distance in topology. The entire mass of living matter contained in the interior space is actively present by the external world at the limit on the living. At the level of the polarized membrane, internal past and external future face one another. Another example of individuation in uh, Simondon's work is the process of crystallization, the passage of a substance from non-stable, amorphous state to a stable crystalline state. Crystallization begins when a seed crystal, and this book, by the way, was, was uh, possessed by Robert Smithson, but this is only a, a parenthesis. Um, begi crystallization begins when a seed crystal is introduced into a substance which is an amorphous anthropic state. The seed crystal communicates its shape to a molecule of, su of the substance, which then communicates the shape to uh, another, and so on. The process of individuation occurs between each crystal and the contiguous amorphous substance. Sorry, I met. The, the process of the individuation occurs between each crystal and the contiguous amorphous substance, always at the surface of the crystal, cre creates, uh, the, creates a, an interesting process that was described. And um, which, uh, in the in the end, terminates when the, the crystal is made, or, or when there is so there is a, a meta metastable or entropic state at the beginning, which uh, finalizes itself in a stable state. Simondon arc. Simonon argues that the simple model of crystallization may be used to understand the process of individuation through physical and biological systems. The difference between animate and inanimate matter is that animate matter managed to sustain certain non-stable states that allow a perpetual individuation in the organism. We perceive distinction between matter and form organism and environment, species and individual, but these are merely manifestation of a single process becoming entropic and pre-individual, which constitutes the real. Thus, Simonon will uncover and enlighten genetic principles contemporary to real processes, first investigating theories of matter, crystallization, and then theories of life, the membrane, the cell's membrane. Simondon concludes with a, a, a theory of form. A technical operation institutes an internal resonance while matter takes form by means of energetic conditions and of topological conditions. Topo topological conditions can be named form and energy conditions express the entire system. As a conclusion, topology and chronology coincide in the uh, in individuation of the living. They are not a priori forms, but the dimensionality of living while it is individualizing. Thus, for Simondon, I met the condition as to think morphogenesis. As a result, it is a genetic process analyzed by Simondon, brick, membranes, or crystals, for example, that allows, I think I have another one, yes, by Wenzel Hablik. As a result, it is a ge uh, genetic process analyzed by Simondon that allows rethinking special categories, such as inside and outside, depth and heights, transparent and opaque, top and bottom, front and, and rear, light and heavy, 
mobile and immobile, speed and slowness, smooth and striated, and so forth. Suddenly, a basic architecture, underground and roof, wall and, and partition, floor and ceiling, passage and disruption, basically all the categories uh, developed, uh, for instance, by, by Bachelard, um, disappear, are rendered obs obsolete, and um, architecture sees its meaning met metamorphosing while transmuting in a topological surface uh, of contact. In conclusion, two two in my opinion, two possibilities of the architecture of today. Either going towards a process of a crystallization, and I give this example here, Valerio Ojati's project for the, this visitor center uh, on a mountain in Switzerland. First example, or the second example, and I don't know if there are opposite yet, uh, the um, you recognize, of course, uh, Jürgen Meyer's Metropole Parasol in Sevilla, which was inaugurated uh, yesterday and will be ter terminated in, in, in April. Uh, and in this case, we, we maybe have a, a crystallization, but we also have something which belongs to the epigen epigenetics, the creation of the cell, of an egg, etc. Those projects uh, uh, propose and in, in induce uh, and force us to think is uh, may, maybe to think again about the line. After all, we have to learn to live on a spline. Is it difficult to live on a spline? And can we inhabit the convexity uh, of an herb? Thank you very much. I like the new orientation. Um, well, now um, I'd like to introduce Evan Douglas. Um, Evan is the Dean of Architecture at Rensselaer RPI, um, a former Chair of Architecture at the School of Architecture at Pratt, has taught in numerous schools, Columbia, Cooper, and Barcelona, and Wuhan in China, and SciArc, many of you will know um, Evan, because he has participated in many of our reviews. He is a principal of Evan Douglas Studio, an interdisciplinary firm focused on intensely innovative applications of digital design and fabrication um, and fabrication technologies, producing exceptionally exceptional gallery installations, interiors, and other types of projects in the city. His investigation of the structure of ornament, of periodicity and aperiodicity, and the smooth is redefined and controlled to a very high degree of precision. I dare say he is inventing a new type of ornament. So extreme is the originality and refinement of his forms and surfaces, despite repetition or because of it, that it insistently reminds us of sensations that seem to be indescribable, looping, foamy, frothy qualities. There are no lines here to speak of. Um, and I have to observe that I think he differs very significantly, very strongly from other digital uh, formal uh, works. Uh, his works differ from those of others in the field today. Um, in the sense of this quality that I, I'm trying to describe that I cannot. Uh, they are powerful in a way that I think is far more likely to be experienced um, in a, by a wider audience, to creating effects that many will experience together. And this is why I think they are so susceptible, why his work is so susceptible in a profound way to a discourse on taste. Um, thank you so much, Evan, for coming tonight.
well, it's an honor to be here at uh, the GSD um, under the leadership of Moisen and Scott. I think uh, all the students are in brilliant hands. Uh, and it's a pleasure to see uh, old friends like Jorge again. It's been many years. Um, 20 minutes is going to be tough, and we'll try our best. Uh, I don't know if, if the lecture is about necessarily uh, describing my own specific uh, thesis, but trying to find a way into a very complex topic through a kind of oblique axis. When Scott informed me that the talk was to be on the subject of beauty, while I was certainly excited by the idea of unpacking the iconography of desire, given my own long-standing fascination with both the production and reception of hyper-exuberant surface and ambient effects in architecture, there was also a certain amount of ambivalence on my part with the term beauty, given its deep-rooted association with the myth of perfection and a tendency historically to overgeneralize aesthetic ideals as a kind of universal truth. My architecture here uh, was not, I'm sorry, my reservation here was not with the merit of reassessing aesthetics in architecture at the turn of the century, which I certainly have great sympathy for as a project, given the rapid increase of computational and material complexity emerging from one year to the next, but a sincere concern that the subject of beauty in particular, given its inherent ubiquitous reputation, functions as a linguistic conundrum, making it impenetrable as an isolated uh, topic of inquiry. Occupying a similar status of difficulty, I'm reminded of Elaine Scarry's research as a literary theorist and cultural critic here at Harvard on the limits and inadequacies of language to fully express many of the most intense sensations of human experience. In the case of her seminal book, The Body in Pain, the making and unmaking of the material world, she discovers an unsettling terrain of behavior innate to our species the emotional and psychological isolation of those in pain. She eloquently argues the impossibility of relaying one's physical suffering to another through words. It's no longer a question of resisting language, as Scary notes. Pain actively destroys it, bringing about an immediate reversion to a state anterior to language itself. While certainly operating at the other end of beauty with respect to its annihilation of pleasure and its implicit threat to any form of culture building, on a perverse level, the pairing of beauty and pain also functions to highlight two opposing phenomena that share great resistance for interpretation. Residing at the two extreme ends of human existence, they expose the surprising limits of language to adequately provide insight and specificity on the unique cognitive and sentient experience emerging from these often misunderstood domains. With that said, I'd like to propose this evening an alternative frame to reassess beauty or the iconography of desire in the context of reading architecture. Might we speak in terms of subliminal attractions, seductive aversions, visions of excess, tropes of abjection, or uncanny incongruities. Rather than perpetuate, as Dave Hickey says, I quote, the, the puritanical canon of visual appeal, it might be more productive to assess the interiority of aesthetic pleasure through a more intentionally subversive line of inquiry. In recognition of the increased difficulty, difficulty to navigate such extreme cultural terrains, the iconography of desire in this context will be reconceptualized as an aggregate of interests based upon the following five performative categories. Disagreeable beauty. If one concedes that forces of attraction are often comprised of opposing interests that uh, under rare circumstances can become dangerously intertwined, then the underlying attributes of disagreeable beauty represents one of the more difficult aesthetic categories to fully reconcile. The artist Daniel Lee's Manimal series offers a rather unsettling view into one, post, into one possible post-humanist future. 
seeking to blur the divine separation between man and animal, his genetically altered portraitures function to highlight the ultimate threat and resulting abomination of a genomic science left unchecked. Although remembered for the firestorm of controversy that surrounded Andrea Serrano's immersion series in the late 80s, specifically his most notable uh, piece, Piss Christ, his photographic work comprised of Klansman portraits, morgue photos, and a range of bodily fluid imagery has collectively sought to bring attention to some of the more culturally charged subjects of our time. Committed to working within a realm of transgression, Serrano's work has mined the power of beauty to domesticize horror and vulgarity. Conscious of the inextricable bond between pain and pleasure, his keen aesthetic agenda should be credited for forcing into the public realm a variety of religious and secular topics that are traditionally deemed problematic and therefore purposefully repressed. Uncanny incongruities. One of, one of a number of radical contributions that emerged in the history of 20th century art was the idea of reconfiguring reality based upon a strategy of uncanny incongruities, purposefully recombining through various techniques of collage, seemingly unrelated compositional components and visual signifiers in favor of a kind of subversive dissonance a new genre of aesthetic pleasure appeared that challenged the traditional convention of order in art. With the arrival of computation today, an even greater degree of iconographic smoothing is now made available, increasing the illusory power of the image to sustain an even higher level of uncanny believability. In Sandy uh, Skoglin's Fox Games art installation, we discover a conventional restaurant setting invaded by a pack of red radioactive foxes, frozen as a series of predators among a clientele oblivious to the invasion. The perverse juxtaposition of these ominous primitives serves to function as a social commentary. Utilizing an absurdist logic of assembly, the imagery obtains a perverse sense of desirability. Although unrelated in terms of content and message, M.C. Escher's double plan planetoid pursues a similar agenda of strange incompatibility in his depiction of modular architectures conjoined all together as one impossible world. Emblematic of a more extreme case of the uncanny, this West African masquerade costume systematically eradicates any iconographic imagery reminiscent of human origin in favor of a kind of metamorphosis back uh, back into nature itself. Posited as a strange and discomforting disillusion, the costume functions as the ultimate camouflage insofar as it implies its own aesthetic demise. Animate flesh. Preoccupying the imagination of countless civilizations is the dream of synthetic immortality where the material world that surrounds us obtains an air of excitability, self-determinism, and a range of performative attributes that radically challenges our enduring sense of all living things as divine and absolute. Given our current efforts in the disciplines of material science, bioengineering, nanotechnology, and robotics, our endless dream to bring inanimate matter to life is becoming increasingly more obtainable as a realistic proposition. Suspended in this strangely perverse realm between man and machine, Bjork's robots call attention to a future of recombinatory creatures that retain the behavioral and iconographic traits of human sensuality reminiscent of a pre-cyborg era. Although one future of animate flesh is based upon a theory of the avatar, another might be aimed at developing the next generation of material behavior. Sachigo Kadama's research with ferrofluids is one such example where hidden magnetic forces are able to transform a seemingly simple liquid into a range of excitable formations instantaneously. Erotic desiring machines. 
In appreciation of the complex laws of attraction, one could conceivably reconceptualize architecture with the right underlying effects in place as a series of perpetual design machines. Reimagined as a network of subliminal triggers embedded within the organizational and material logic of its surface, an increase of desirability would emerge perpetuating the endless game of consumption. Although fundamentally different in terms of their unique cultural practices, M.C. Escher and Hans Belmar curiously share a similar vision of a world based upon an obsession with anagrammatic assembly systems. Here, the continuous rearrangements of similar parts serve to perpetuate the illusion of infinity and erotic surprise. Dazzle topology. In appreciation of the value of the haptic in architecture, dazzle topology represents an invaluable source of insight underlaying the retinal effects of intricacy and surface complexity. Seeking to elevate the status of the surface in architecture today as the new site of projected desire, understanding the relational correspondence between surface and seeing is a critical area of inquiry for all those committed to maximizing the full effects offered in this new era of topological expression. As example, in the spirit of, of Hans Hoblein's legendary anamorphosis painting, The Ambassadors, one might reassess, with our ever-increasing engine of computational power, the role of illusory techniques today as an opportunity to achieve greater control over the conceptual and cinematic effects in architecture. So we will follow by, uh, I realize we're running out of time, so uh, this is a, a quick summary of the projects in our office and I will, rather than try to kind of unpack uh, the conceptual motivations that underlie them in relation to the thesis that I've just stated, I will simply uh, go through them as a matter of fact. Uh, this is a project uh, which was an installation some years ago for Jean Pouvet. Uh, it began at Columbia University. Uh, it moved uh, to Mocha to the West Coast. Uh, and we're negotiating as we speak for a home and a permanent collection in a museum. Uh, all I will say is that uh, it attempts to set up a kind of um, conversation with Pouvet looking uh, at his thesis from a contemporary viewpoint. This project is helioscopes. Uh, we were commissioned by the Frock Center uh, and they were interested in the work we were doing uh, on computation, but more specifically uh, the kind of uh, the fascination with uh, working with these new excitable surfaces in the context of inhabitation. The helical tail has an opening and orifice uh, uh, at eye height for an LCD screen panel, uh, and it provides an uh, enormous amount of curatorial control in the context of being able to uh, project a variety uh, of video material. Um, I'd like to think that it's a kind of a restation of something that is uh, continuously in flux. Uh, this is the project called Reptile. It was uh, for a Japanese restaurant in New York City. Uh, the priority uh, of the design response concentrated on a, a custom modular tile system. There are uh, 12 uh, mother pieces that repeat or aggregate it into a field. Uh, there's a pyramid and a, and a, sm a soft, smooth surface that are regulated by video software. Uh, and similar to a, a, a kind of improvisational jazz, one is playing uh, hundreds of iterations in order to uh, enable certain effects to emerge that are deemed acceptable. Uh, once again, uh, like most of the work, there is a explicit attempt to uh, have the surface uh, acquire a, a certain kind of animate sensibility. Uh, this is Floriflex. Uh, it was a project uh, we were invited um, to participate uh, in a ceramic uh, institute in, in uh, Holland. 
some time back, uh, and the, the program at hand or the, or the competition that they had uh, sent out internationally was what would be the next brick of the 21st century, and this is uh, my response. Uh, it's a modular system that nests both the, the kind of radial unit and the kind of T-sections, uh, and depending on where you stand in relation to the surface, it will either become transparent or opaque. Uh, the second uh, generation uh, of that system uh, introduced a second flange. Uh, all of this was computationally driven so that there's a massive uh, archive of options available and one could go back uh, in the context of modifying the effects. Uh, this particular generation uh, was part of a proposal for the Museum of Modern Art. The L Tower uh, was a project on the, uh, the Lower West Side in Manhattan. Uh, we were approached by a developer uh, who was interested in building on top of uh, the current UPS building, which is a seven-story structure. Uh, and uh, their idea was that there would be freestanding uh, outdoor pavilions uh, where there would be a kind of elevated urbanism in New York. Um, and that uh, uh, they were looking for us to create uh, an open-air membrane that would move horizontally uh, as a kind of uh, structural uh, um, aesthetic branding mesh uh, into the vertical uh, to cover a hotel on the north side uh, and function as a kind of brise soleil. This was a quick uh, early scheme. We then uh, moved over. This is a 3D print a photograph of a 3D print so you can begin to see that uh, we're deploying a, a diagrid that is undergoing a series of transformations based on its, where it's located on that surface. Uh, and although this is the primary structure, uh, there will be a secondary uh, set of accessorized elements that will bring back the, the kind of complexity or exuberance we were talking about. And these were initial, uh, we were working with Arab these are initial uh, renderings uh, of what that, uh, that uh, kind of urban roofscape would look like. Unfortunately, at the time, the recession hit, and this was put on hold. Uh, each of the pavilions inside, which are the roofs are covered with grass, these would be designed by uh, uh, specific uh, architects chosen by the owners of the buildings, and our responsibility was just to deal with the shroud. Uh, there are some projects that are uh, beginning to emerge in Abu Dhabi, and this is an installation that we will be producing. It's a 3D print. Uh, it continues some of the research in the L Tower with respect to woven and braided uh, line work, uh, and it's, um, it's an investigation. I'd say this is a prototype for a column that would be extended into a freestanding building. And recently, we've been doing a lot of work in glass. Uh, I find enormous fascination, as you can tell, uh, uh, working on and off the computer, uh, and certainly working with sophisticated uh, materials, but ones that have been around for a very, very long time. These are all glass blown uh, into um, aircraft uh, cable nets, uh, and it's the beginning, I would say, of a kind of product line that's attempting to tame glass uh, in favor of uh, very specific effects and in the context of lighting as a program. Um, another project uh, in Abu Dhabi, uh, there will be three to five hundred of these that will be suspended like a, a kind of cloud or topological shroud above one's head. And the final project I'll show, this is a restaurant uh, in Brooklyn, New York. It's called Choice. Uh, and it, um, the client came to us and, and asked us to, uh, they were certainly impressed by the work we were doing uh, with respect to contemporary surfaces, but they wanted to purposefully uh, find a way to merge uh, a sensibility that was both old and new. There is a modular tile that you can see here. It has uh, three uh, openings, so it's able to aggregate in all directions. Uh, the openings uh, satisfy both lighting, sprinkler system, and sound. 
Uh, there was a custom uh, chandelier, once again, glass blown into wire cages. Uh, there's a main tile uh, that's in the center of the restaurant, and as it transitions to the perimeter and the frame, there is a com uh, the, there's a new modular element that is entirely flat, but increases the level of complexity of ornament across its surface. So although it doesn't acquire as much three-dimensional real estate, the juxtaposition between the two modes of um, speed uh, were intended. And this is a shot of the entire restaurant. Thank you very much. Okay, you've not made my task easy, gentlemen. Okay, part of the rule of engagement is that Scott is normally, <coughs> you know, I'm the historian, he's the practitioner, as you all know, and usually practitioner like to improvise and historian like to have time, but we've decided to invert the role, so I'm constantly, so I'm, I'm going to improvise a few commentary from what I've heard, which I discovered was really fascinated, fascinating, and then we can have the beginning of the conversation, and then I turn to you uh, to go on uh, after uh, these f first exchanges. First of all, thank you for two truly wonderful presentations. I was struck by the number of things that circulate between one and the other, and I don't know uh, you know, there were a lot of connection, the body, there were even a little bit of prosthesis, some kind of, kind of neo-sadistic touch uh, uh, on suffering, the link between taste, suffering, and pleasure, etc., etc. So I will begin by a few remarks for Georges, and then uh, I'll pass to Evan, and I hope, feel free to interject. So first, Georges, I wanted to tell you, you really disappointed me as an 18th century <laughs> scholar. I have to say, I was expecting, you know, not this sublime taste, but something a bit lighter, you know, the taste of a Marcus, uh, the t you know, the taste in terms of social taste. And what you served us was not really, you know, this problem of taste as social, but something very foundational, having to do with dynamic beauty, with taste as almost something neo-digital, having to do with emergence. So I wanted uh, to ask you, you know, and very different from, you know, the taste that was discussed uh, by other 18th century aesthetics, which has more to do with the idea of what everybody likes and what everybody dislikes. You know, the kind of definition of taste that Bourdieu will later take on in his book on distinction. So I wanted actually to really ask you, you know, what, why did you choose that? Have you really a problem with taste as superficial? And uh, uh, with probably, you know, something also I found really interesting what you said, which is this connection between taste and the body. Because that, was, that came extremely strongly in what you said. And I wanted to ask you, by the end, who is the subject in this affair? In the taste as social, who know, we know who is the subject. It's the social subject, the person who is educated at various levels, etc. You have good and bad taste. So who is your subject would be my question. Is it the generic individual of Simon Don? Is it something else? So that would be my first remark. But really, I was terribly disappointed not to see uh, French 18 century taste, but something more in a kind of, you know, as I said, almost emerging, emergence. It could be published today by, uh, uh, in a book on digital architecture. Now on Evan. There I found a lot of 18th century stuff, actually, you know, speaking of 18th century <laughs> desire, uh, you know, punishment, you know, had the impression to be out of a Marquis de Sade novel, and I really appreciated that. And then with, however, a number of 19th century things, like, for example, impulse, you know, and then I, I was reminded at some point of the criminal ornament of Lombroso. 
-hmm. know, the, the guy who inspired to Adolf Loos the ornament as crime. So the idea that there is something, you know, almost a bit dirty in, uh, in the pleasure we have from ornament. So then I was wondering, uh, and then there are other Sadian terms like repetition. Mm -hmm. that, uh, so I was wanting to ask you, is there some kind of implicit morality in the affair? As if, you know, a kind of Sadian thing going too far is actually pushing you toward back to moral, uh, to a kind of moral thing. With another question, which is, what is the limit? Is there even a limit? Which, to go back to my idea of taste as social, you know, I was really struck by the end, is there something like bad taste? Because I was expecting, you know, that there would be something like bad taste. And you presented, you know, unfortunately, very beautiful stuff. So I was wondering, you know, where do we have the bad taste? You spoke a lot about the ugly. We didn't get the ugly, not even the bad taste. So I'll conclude these brief remarks, which are more a provocation so that you can react. You know, what always disappoints me in architecture is how serious we are by the end. You know, in the 18th century, you know, it was such a drama for architectural theory, especially in France, to think that taste could be social, that taste could be something dependent on education, etc. I'm thinking of the debate after Perrault. Uh, and we still have difficulty to come to terms with an architecture that would be deeply superficial. We talk a lot about the skin, about this and that, but we still try to relate taste to very fundamental questions. So my question to both would be, what if, what if it was interesting actually to reinvent a true superficiality, a gratuity of, of taste, the one that comes from good or bad education, from prejudice, from all these things that we try usually to exclude from architecture. So feel Ooh. free to. Yeah, that's all. That's it. <clears throat> well, Antoine wants to 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 put me back. Uh, I want to put you closer to the microphone first. Well, in 18th century, they didn't need a, a, a mic. Mic. <laughs> Well, I, I'm not a Bourdieu guy. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and of course, he's very important. He's, he's most, the most important sociologist of, of, of art and culture in France. I agree with that. And boring. Agree. <laughs> uh, but um, I sort of di disagree with, with um, his approach. And um, I'll, I'll do could go also into some uh, <coughs> anecdote about the contradictory, the, the contradiction in, in that kind of guy, um, but well, maybe that's not the place to, 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 to say that. So my, my approach is not at all Bourdieu-like. Um, no, no, but I, you could I, have been. I, I avoided Bourdieu. What, all, what all is the good taste, the, t the taste à la grecque? And all these things, you know, you, you took a pretty essentialist take on taste, which is very close to a kind of dynamic beauty thing, which is taste as opposed to static, the static beauty of former proportion and having to do with, you know, curvy linearity, continuous deformation, etc. What about, you know, having just simply good and bad taste? Okay. But as soon as you say good and bad taste, or. Um... Trying to provoke you. <laughs> The, uh, either you go in Diderot and uh, the discussion about the public, the salon, and uh, who's going to appreciate uh, good art uh, and, and bad art, but then how education is going to be done, because at, uh, as soon as you stay taste, uh, it, it's, it's all about education. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And, and education can be either of the public or, or of the, the artist himself, uh, oneself. And and uh, the, the guy who knew all about that uh, was Kant, but then Kant is very difficult. I agree. And you've been f we've been for too long in academia to really appreciate <laughs> education. You know that. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> to, to bring it back to today, um, uh, good taste and bad taste. Um, I, I think it, it, it would be interesting. I, I would like to know what uh, I'm bringing it forcefully back on, on, on today's matters. Um, it would be interesting to know what Spanish think about the metropole parasol. Uh, 
The, the measurable parasol is a competition. I showed to my two last my slides, mm -hmm. uh, my last two slides. And uh, I was teaching once in Zurich. I, I had a Spanish uh, architect just sitting beside me. And I start to say, very excited. Oh, you know, they're building the Metropole Paracel in Seville. And this guy say, I am from Seville. Uh, but he's very angry. <laughs> so I start to push him a little more, say, I hate the project. OK. <laughs> and suddenly I realized that the whole profession in Spain is, is against the project and takes this as an offense, a personal offense against himself. Uh, and I won't go into too much deep in, in that story. Maybe, you know, there is different kind of public. There is a public of architects and architect judging of one another. And the, this kind of public we know very well. Usually they hate one another, uh, but that's part of the job. Uh, th then there is a, the public himself. I would be very optimistic about the public. I'm putting my, my left hand, okay, not the right one. I'm putting my left hand on, on the bed that the, the public will appreciate Sevilla, that this project will be a huge success, that, that will be, it will be a, um, a re-energizing re of the whole city, that will become a, a place of festivals, of people will come from all over the world to, to visit it. I mean, of course, we all know about what, what is called the Bilbao effect. Nobody knew about Bilbao. It was a very boring industrial city. Suddenly, Frank Gehry built his museum, and it creates a Bilbao effect. I think in that case, the Bilbao effect, uh, and it's a bet. You know, we have no proof of okay, that. Okay, so you, you're betting that you have good taste, George. No, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm betting that the, the today's public, like the, 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 the youth, the crowd, the people who like to assemble together, have good taste. Okay. I'm, I'm betting on that. Okay. Evan? I know it's an impossible question. So Three just, impossible questions. But um, you, you raise the issue of morality. Uh, you raise the issue of limit. I would imagine that uh, the, the production of, of a certain ethos, whether it uh, moves into a more horrific and transgressive direction or it's more classically beautiful, uh, is there a boundary uh, concerning that production that would produce a kind of uh, inverted entropy? And then the third one is uh, you spoke about a kind of darkness in, in the presentation. Um, no perfect way to open this. Uh, maybe I'll respond directly to uh, academia and the practice where there's an enormous amount of complexity that is made available uh, with the computer uh, and um, rather difficult uh, um, to assert and distinguish oneself. It was interesting. Uh, when Scott was um, introducing me, and I take that as a compliment, and, and, and uh, I can't be objective enough to be able to understand exactly what those terms are, but um, it, it seems to me it's apropos that one raised the question of aesthetics at a time where there is such a multiplicity of variation mm -hmm. that is available, and uh, the presentation was purposely uh, interested in uh, um, presenting images that um, are uncomfortable, disquieting, um, associated, uh, some of them uh, at a moment historically with shock. I don't know if they are able to um, achieve the same power today as they may have. Um, I suppose it's uh, back to the students. Uh, it's a provocation uh, for all of you to look at the production of your work simultaneously with respect to the, the choice of effects in relation to the message and thesis that's intended as it goes out into the world. And that, that's another thing. I, it's, uh, you may be the authors uh, of the work, but certainly uh, there are different uh, orbits within which your work will be received, and each of those orbits 
uh, has a bias. And it was interesting to, uh, to hear George's presentation uh, because uh, how fascinating to go back in time and that certain uh, moments of inquiry uh, become the kind of, how should you say, the obsession or fetish at that moment, and then they get discarded and replaced by something else. So it's, uh, it, it's uh, curious the inherent dilemma with aesthetics because at some moment it's temporal, right? It's specific to place, uh, uh, it's region, context, the discourse, uh, and yet uh, certain, it is fascinating how certain great works, and George uh, highlighted genius, are able to sustain time and move out of one historical orbit into many other ones and still attract, uh, although the meaning of the work may shift, uh, an enormous amount of attention mm -hmm. uh, from, from a cultural standpoint, but certainly the aesthetic construction of it participates in that. Um, and I, I, you know, listen, we all, uh, as, as creative uh, individuals, uh, there are things that compel you, and, and I've always um, found enormous uh, fascination uh, with those kinds of edge conditions mm -hmm. where, you know, you said you didn't show anything ugly. Uh, 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 well, I don't, I don't, the word is, is difficult to even kind of work off of. I'd like to think that, there, that, that we're talking about degrees uh, of, uh, of difficulty or that, that, that work has a kind of problematic condition built into it and some of it is more familiar and domesticized so there's kind of a deep latency of messages and other ones come to the surface, maybe they're more literal. I think what related also your, your two talks for me is that the question of choice, you know, I was really struck at the beginning by your lines and the Hogarth line and you know, the problem is to choose the right line in between the, 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 the too sloppy and the too nervous. Uh, and uh, and uh, in your case also, there is definitely in all this work on endless possible variation, mm -hmm. there is a choice. And I was wondering if by the end, the opposition between beauty and taste is not that beauty is the system and taste is the choice. Because this is when actually taste is about making a selection. Well, uh, 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 try to answer that. It was, it's, for me, it's strangely perverse that a line, as an inscription, uh, can be encoded with an ethic. It's, it, it's wild. And certainly at, at a time where there are so many lines that are required to construct, that underlie the assembly of complex surfaces, it would be impossible today to cut a section or a plan and say that a single projection has a very specific et, um, agenda to it. But uh, I'm trying to kind of get back to this. I, 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 I'm trying to link y your question of limit now. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, in a game of, of repetition, uh, um, there's an in inherent problem that uh, uh, one's desire to sustain uh, interest and exuberance could collapse at any moment. Mm -hmm. and, and part of this is, is due to, uh, to the, sp the specificity of the constructed surface, and another part of it is, is due to the arena and the scale at which it moves into the world. And at certain scales, certain information, uh, certain forms of seduction would be lost and, and, and become uh, disappear or repress, and other ones would become dominant. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I... If yeah, it does make sense. Desire has a scale, which is interesting yeah. also, yeah. which I never thought. Desire has a scale in some ways. Okay, I think we can probably turn. I'm sure there must be a lot of reaction and questions, so please now feel free to jump in. Not everyone at the same time, but yes. Hi, thank you very much. I'm wondering if uh, a work of architecture um, or an aesthetic uh, work um, or a curve or a surface is unclear or lacks clarity, it is of bad taste, uh, both for the one that created it and especially for the one uh, that desires it. I, I, 
I mean, I hope one of the messages in the presentation is I'm uncomfortable uh, with a certain uh, tradition of taxonomic terms. I, I, I don't, I know, and, it, and it, it was helpful to hear George talk about taste in the context of a critique, uh, as though we, each of us uh, come to the world uh, with a, a specific, uh, how should I say it, history and intuition and kind of learned practices, and we will certainly uh, project that onto the world and make choices. Uh, it seems to me an artist is conscious of the traps of that uh, and is continuously seeking out subversive strategies in their work to be able to undermine the predictability of that, right? Uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm reminded of uh, Jackson Pollock and, and uh, uh, anyone who puts into place a kind of challenge to the authority of a certain uh, accepted means of representation or thinking. So I, I don't, uh, I, I don't know if I'm answering uh, your question. I, I certainly uh, think that there's lots of work in the world that's banal, um, and I, I don't attribute it to a straight line or a curve. <laughs> I just, I, I, I don't think that, that it, it, it has undergone the appropriate uh, assessment and interrogation and, and, and uh, iterative development either both conceptually or methodologically to be able to achieve some status of power. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, another question up there. I think that uh, the question of taste inevitably brings up the um, issues related to style. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about any connection or the connections that you see between taste and style, and whether you think um, style could be seen as uh, a periodic or a period where there's some sort of consensus of taste. That's I think a, that it's a, it's style a great, It's a great question. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm reminded of the inherent uh, challenge every academic institution uh, faces, whereby we've uh, put up these um, these benevolent walls uh, to be able to create a culture and a community of intellectual and creative inquiry that has some uh, depth and merit and it takes risk mm -hmm. to somehow look at the world within which we reside and do something profound that contributes to that in juxtaposition to a, uh, a global uh, media apparatus that uh, needs to find the commodification of all things in order to sustain a, a capitalist agenda. And architecture is caught into that swirl as well. So um, it's always interesting to walk through a studio and see students as an educator uh, with the books or magazines that they have on their tables and to what extent and how are they interpreting that work. Speaking, uh, speaking uh, of unclear big books, don't tell me that Schumacher already arrived. Was that right? The Schumacher book already oh, arrived at Rensselaer? Yes. Well, I haven't seen it yet. But Patrick has already sent an email and asked all of us what we think. Um, it's, it's, it's a fascinating phenomenon. It, it's, the, it's this, uh, and it's not just the magazines, obviously it's the internet that, that, uh, that architecture becomes commodified. It was interesting to, to hear, it was a small article, I believe, in the Times on the recent uh, selection of the Pritzker Prize winner, and Ken Frampton was front and center. And you could, you could just see Ken with his sharpened knives. He certainly, he's brilliant. He has a, a, a certain bias in architecture, and uh, I'm not sure that his favorite architect is Zaha Hadid or Tom Main, and he made that clear, but he, uh, the, the, the underlying, sorry to move into that segue, the underlying message was, I understood, and I thought it had merit, was that there are great architects in the world, and there are certainly great buildings that are not so easily obtained representationally uh, within the, the stream of media. Uh, they certainly don't acquire the same, the same status of recognition. Uh, I mean, if you were to juxtapose uh, um, Zaha with uh, Lucan, 
for instance, that it would, and I'm not, I'm not, there's no value statement here. I actually think that there's an enormous variety of, of architecture available as language for all of us uh, to pursue, but certainly some of it can be more easily moved at a high speed and then rewarded for that. And I think the argument in, in Frampton's comment was uh, here's an architect that uh, may not be as sexy and as well known, but he's quite brilliant. George, you wanted to say something on style? Yes. Um, because I was invited to, to speak about beauty, even if it's a, the eclipse of, of the beauty and uh, taste, etc. I phone to, to some um, to my digital friends all over the, the world and say, "Hey, what's beauty today?" And say, "Okay, George, start with the uh, AD2 uh, of 207 on elegance." So I, I took that in the library. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there is a wonderful essay by Delanda, uh, but I'm not good enough in math, so uh, I, I couldn't use it. But he he is a real expert about topology, by the way. Yeah and uh, quite fascinating. And then there was a horrible article by Mr. Schumacher, I think. <laughs> Patrick Schumacher, who says that parametricism is a style. Uh, and then I receive on, uh, on the mail the, the last issue of Log, and, and the same thesis is repeated and repeated. And then he put himself on, on, on the web, so it's EE. You don't even have to buy the magazine. But you, you, just print, but then you don't print anymore because it always says the state. The same that parameters is a style, and he is a, the, the 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 beholder of that style, and nobody else. By the way, if I I was an architect, I would be really uh, <laughs> angry about that. <laughs> hey, guy, keep calm. You know? <laughs> Stay put. Okay, you have 120 students at the AA, but okay. You know, how do you teach them, by the way? Yeah. This you, you don't tell. <laughs> um, so I was, uh, and, and thank you for your nice article on, on Lug that I, I read uh, recently, uh, which I, I think was a very good uh, reply and, and answer. So here, here you, you've got my, my idea on style. Mm -hmm. That was clear. <laughs> Other reaction? Yeah. I think one of the phrases that was very interesting that was said tonight that, um, or a question that was asked that if beauty is a system, is taste the choice? Um, and I'd like to react to that. If beauty is the system and taste is the choice, um, where, where may we connect them? And if one develops or changes, can the other develop and change with it? Uh, you asking this to who? Oh, you like me, you like simple questions. <laughs> well, I, I liked your question, um, but I'd like to hear how they, I, I'm interested in how they connect. Um, if, if beauty or the system of beauty is able to change over time and, and can it, and then if there is that connection, if we make that choice uh, and taste is that choice, the can that also change with the system of beauty? The question is system of beauty changes? Yes, continuously, I mean, the, yeah. a, a, every month. I think the problem today is that we have probably no system of beauty but we have to make choices, which is why in some ways the problem of taste arise again. Because sometimes you have to use taste as a kind of provisory method within the incertitude of principles. Uh, I, another answer to what you, you're asking, uh, we, we couldn't have, have the same d debate uh, in, in 19, say, 1998, or like, you know, a few years ago. For me, 1998 is like just yesterday. Oh, my God, oh, we're already 2012. <laughs> it's going too fast. So, uh, but, but then I realized we couldn't have the same debate. We wouldn't have the same uh, parameters without speaking of uh, parameterism. And uh, so, that's when you, one morning you wake up and you realize, you know, the whole game is completely My different. My beauty is long gone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Question? Yes. Yes. Um, at several points in this, uh, this talk tonight, uh, the question of education 
and the foundation of of this system in a way of of uh, of taste and beauty has come up. Um, and I, I, as a student, the uh, I think each school has has a system, has kind of a consensus on what uh, generally is is found to be uh, aesthetically pleasing. Um, but what I'm curious, as as several uh, uh, academics, uh, I'm wondering why why has academia as a whole not been able to um, be more effectual in its implementation of this system of beauty. Hmm. Mm. There's, there's a lot of one. You just uh, Scott moved a little bit, and Moisen moved. I could see there's a little tremor there. <laughs> um, Should ask Scott. I, I, I don't. I, I, maybe I'm. I'm. I'm very. Uh, certainly, uh, all schools uh, uh, ha construct a culture, and and it, it, I, it, I'm very hesitant to generalize about that culture although I do think the differences among the schools is a good thing. And I think it's the responsibility of the leadership of the school, uh, in the best of cases, to put together a heterogeneous model so that uh, there is no specific uniformity and that the tension uh, and um, aggregation between these different schools of thought is, is seen as a positive thing that could produce a third condition. I, I would be very uncomfortable describing schools in terms of style and taste and aesthetics. I, I would prefer to talk about it as a cultural, a series of cultural projects that spin out in a variety of ways, whether it uh, resides uh, within the word and the book uh, or it moves into specific material practices that are either analog or digital, or it, um, it foregrounds an ethical agenda with respect to environmental uh, in interests. You know, w whatever the, the kind of uh, cultural topic narrative might be, or m many of them might be, that kind of motivate and engender the place is, is, is most important. I, I'm not suggesting that, uh, that aesthetics isn't a, a, a deep challenge uh, uh, historically w within our profession, certainly within the design community. I'm, I used to, in the 90s, uh, teach at Columbia University where we had the paperless studios, right? And I remember, I was teaching at uh, Cooper Union and Columbia University at the same time. It, you couldn't find two uh, diametrically opposed, opposed uh, educational institutions, and they were equally fascinating. But Uptown, uh, you know, they had um, acquired uh, Maya, which, is, you know, it's so funny to talk about that. It was radical at the time. It was coming out of the automobile industry and uh, Hollywood, uh, and we would be sitting on juries with Bernard and Stern and Frampton and Greg Lynn and the whole thing. And uh, w one of the things that I remember, aside from an enormous amount of excitement and enthusiasm to tame this monster, was the difficulty to speak about it. The, it took a number of years, to be, uh, for, as far as I remember, for many of these critics, and they're brilliant, to be able to construct the appropriate nomenclature uh, uh, to even open up a, an architectural critique as we know it. These shapes were, um, and, and I've always hated the word blob, couldn't stand it. And that's why I, I'm, I haven't read Patrick's book, and I'm, I'm sure it's well intended, but I'm very uncomfortable like deconstruction with these singularities that function as uh, um, kind of cultural shrouds. To, they often wrap up uh, research, they don't open it. So back to the to the little story there. Um, how difficult it was to be able to find the proper terms by which to interrogate the work. It, it eventually got there. I still think there's a struggle. Uh, I still think that uh, um, the however powerful and I and I love the computer. It's astonishing to me how many students. Um, they lose their ability to author the production of the work, and it's the software and the kind of uh, uh, predisposition to 
um, privilege certain effects that dominate, and it requires a rather forceful and uh, critical guide, and I'm talking about teacher institution, to be able to help them evaluate uh, these tools uh, in a critical way. Uh, and certainly, as I mentioned before, at what moment do they receive the imprint of culture? Because they live in these beautiful, uh, uh, formless, uh, non-gravitational spaces, and, and they're quite sexy. But the moment they become printed, they're assigned a scale, they become built as a maquette or full scale, something uh, emerges that may be unexpected, and the question is, does the author know what that is? Thank you. I think we take one last question, and I think it will be time to wrap up. Ingeborg? Okay, I have a question for you and a comment maybe on the last um, answering of the question. I understood system the way you ask, Antoine, more as, let's say, the logic um, that would be the, the algorithm, and um, in a way, you set that up in a kind of beautiful economy, and then the matter of choice is more you have the infinite possibilities of outcome, let's say, and the matter of choice would mm -hmm. be then a taste-driven one. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I'm just curious, let's say, in particular your work, um, Evan, in how far still that matter of choice is made, and then also you had this very interesting subversive quality you put forward today as the line of argument, and I'm curious in how far that plays really a role in your actual work. Um, so maybe you could talk about it, and also how far you see, let's say, that algorithmic approach in general be capable of having that subversive quality, um, with other words, a kind of critical edge to it. Mm. Um, well, the, 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 the comment about uh, to what extent uh, uh, do the five categories that I presented what role do they play and manifest in the work? Uh, I'm. It's 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 a tough one to answer because I'm certainly aware that some of it is there, and it's it's uh, another way of putting this is uh, in the genesis of many of my projects, there is a kind of. Um, constellation of interests that are functioning uh, simultaneously and I've always been fascinated by uh, this notion of a subliminal a set of triggers that are in the work but they uh, resist easy identification and I'm I'm very very attuned to uh, Associative signifiers. How do I put that? And although the the last one probably is the one that's most pronounced in in terms of being able to find direct links to certain moments historically, I'd like to think that they're sufficiently mm, blended and uh, um, kind of uh, reconfigured so that the moment. Uh, one of those associations were to emerge, another one would replace it. What I don't, I'm not, um, certainly a, a number of examples in my, the first half of my presentation spoke about body politic uh, and, and politics of space in general, uh, which I think is essential in architecture. I, I don't know if that is so explicitly foregrounded in my work, but uh, as an intellectual project, I have great sympathy for it, and and I suppose it comes back to the question of taste too, because at at some moment uh, it's 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 no longer about us. These are collective projects. I'm talking about uh, the reception of one's work and the, and the possibility that you could anticipate um, uh, messages that do different forms of work, right? And, and I'm, I'm reminded of the, the kind of, uh, of upheaval that's taking place in the Middle East, right? And uh, it's interesting to think uh, how uh, the architecture as a discipline um, has the potential, right, to deal with certain ethical questions. There were, th but there was a, th a tripart to your, your comments, right? And 
I'm sorry. Yeah, the other question was more related to um, the digital medium, let's say, or the uh, question of the system of beauty, which I thought Antoine evoked. Maybe I'm wrong, but I heard it more as being, let's say, um, what what your work is underlying is, let's say, an algorithm, mm -hmm. and then your taste decision is which particular outcome out of the range of possibilities you have at hand, you're choosing then to be the final product you put in front of the public. And I was curious in how far you think in generally how um, that project can be of a critical nature, let's say. Mm. As a, in other words, also how it can be in a very um, choreographed and authorized way be um, of, of subversive quality. Yeah. Um, well, I, uh, I I don't. I'll try to get on this one. I, I when you bring up uh, algorithms, uh, uh, certainly the the way in which to uh, move the work forward within that virtual realm is based on a set of scripted equations, and and I'm always trying to uh, move those equations out into the physical world and assess their haptic consequences. Uh, I. I I've always thought uh, uh, some of uh, the most amazing architecture is wonderfully erotic, and it, and it doesn't necessarily have to look erotic. Ultimately, um, it has to do with a certain kind of psychological stance and maybe a, um, a, a disquieting, um, problematized relation to the work that captivates the audience and keeps them interested in the in the most curious way. Um, Evan, yeah. I, I think on this evocation that promises a long and fascinating night, yes. or perhaps a thousand others, we, we might perhaps uh, conclude this debate. And I'd like to thank you both again thank for you. a thank wonderful you. set of presentations. Thank you so much. Great.